I thought it'd be fun to talk about like what actually brought you or why you started working yep. with us. Cause that's where we might talk about narrative and some other stuff too. So that's where I was like, let's just actually talk about that. Yeah, and no, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of funny because I feel like we ended up in the same headspace about marketing independently. Yes. And then we met and it was like, oh, like started stacking ideas on each other yep. and started kind of accelerating the way we were thinking about marketing together, which is kind of exciting. Tell me about that like headspace then. So like, how did you see marketing? Mm -hmm. And then how did, like, how do you see it a little bit? So I think that it kind of started, you know, I, I moved into a new role and inherited an MQL number. Yep. Um, and, you know, I'd already been kind of suspect of a lot of these marketing tactics. I'd seen con content syndication programs fail miserably, even from like a lead quality perspective. But, you know, I move into a new role and you inherit, you know, they're like, okay, we need you to double our monthly leads. And you're like, okay. Yep. Look at that. And um, I think the, the big thing was I took a look and I, I pulled it all the way through the funnel and tied it to revenue. And not just by channel, but also by like down to the AdWords campaign. Because yeah. we could look at saying like, okay, where, which of these actual keywords is converting your revenue? And we found that like 90% of our marketing spend was going into AdWords basically, at least of our you know, discretionary. And it was resulting in you know, about 20% of our closed one bookings from marketing. Yeah. And so I was able to basically take, take that budget and trim it down and say, okay, these are the two keywords that are actually like converting to revenue. Yep. And the rest of it was money I could then run growth experiments with yep. and try to figure out how to actually you know, drive more people to start searching for those keywords in the first place. And so that's kind of what started unlocking this like new way of thinking about marketing. We re realigned all of our goals around pipeline um, with a you know look at closed one revenue on a quarterly basis to gut check that we were doing the right thing. Yep. But you know I was able to kind of reorient the whole team around this pipeline number instead of this this MQL number because we actually dropped our MQL number by like sixty percent yep. and had an increase in marketing pipeline and it was just like okay so like what other channels and what other ways do we do this yeah that's interesting so that's actually yes very similar to what I went through I worked at a company and it was we had an MQL number yeah. and what happened was funny is I don't know if you went through this but my, the MQL goal just kept going up because we thought that's <laughs> what it was so it was like 400 percent like quarter over quarter because that was like oh well here's our new pipeline goal it's like well the only way we're gonna hit that is that because we're doing MQLs, right? So it was literally going up like 400%. And then we did, you know, I don't want to say bad marketing. I think if that's your goal and what you're measured on, like we uh, we do, we call them over the finish line campaigns. So like the end of the week, you'd be like, oh, are we short of our goal? Okay. Well, if we send the pricing page to everybody five points short of the damn. Of the, of the number you made up. Yes, yes. And we're like, wait, we, we hit our MQL goal. And then we started doing this, you mentioned content syndication. I just laugh because we did, so there's this thing called priority engine, which is like the IT buyers and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Or it's the intent date. And I know there's companies doing this now. We'd be like, oh, an account showing intent, we're gonna get leads. And then we're gonna be like, here's MQLs for you based on that intent data. And like, that's the journey I went through. And then, cause what I want to piggyback next, you, you mentioned like the pipeline and stuff. Cause this is where I still think it's, it's getting harder still, which is, okay, we're like, well, MQLs don't align to revenue or maybe we can talk about this. Cause this is where we were aligned too. I went through that and then I started going, all right, we're going to go do like account-based marketing, right? Cause it, to me yeah. it was the leads aren't working. So everybody's like, oh, okay, we'll go do account-based marketing. I keep talking about these shifts where you're not like fixing the problem but i think you like you kind of went through that same stuff too oh, yeah. where you went account based like demand gen and you're like brand and i mean i think the value in account based marketing is the idea of your icp it's the idea of how are we segmenting our market how are we talking to them so that we're communicating value and it's getting like super aligned with sales on those things and so like yeah. that early stage mechanic is invaluable for our revenue team but it's all the stuff that they help people tell you to do afterwards that doesn't work yeah yeah i think when looking back to what bothers me with the account-based thing is 
everybody's still doing what they were doing for like the MQL stuff, just to accounts. And that's what I've noticed where people aren't or fixing. Or just display ads. Or just display ads, yes. I had somebody <laughs> ask me that the other day. They're like, what about display? Are you guys running those for customers? And I was like, I don't think we have a single customer we're doing display ads for right now. I just don't see any ROI on them anymore. Like, it just doesn't work. Um, yeah. What about, so the biggest thing I have, and we, we, we both sold into like mid-market enterprise mm -hmm. where I'm struggling right now, even personally, is still like marketing being measured on like pipeline and revenue, especially because one, those are huge lagging indicators at like yep. larger deal sizes. Absolutely. And two, I think we're really dismissing that how much sales motion is required and that that it's 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 not fair to measure marketing at sometimes on those huge lagging indicators, especially when marketing doesn't fully control a pipeline number. And that's kind of what I I mean, I think it's I think it's I, I agree with you and I don't because okay. I think it depends on the stage of the business and how mature your marketing function yep. is. Because I think if you have a if you have a historical predictable pipeline generation from marketing, I think it's fair to expect that to get better. But you don't necessarily not most marketing teams don't have a channel that they've like yes. really grokked yet and like figured out like how how do I drive a predictable amount from these from from these these leads and then then you have to start going up the funnel and figuring out like what are the first indicators that you might have you know, beyond to something that you can repeat. Yeah. And I think that a lot of teams are getting in trouble because they're they're you know listening to people saying oh you need to me measure marketing on pipeline and they don't have something that they they don't have something repeatable yet. Yeah. They haven't learned enough to sign up for that and then you know, just like your lead number goes up every quarter, yep. now your pipeline number does, and it's, you know, it's putting everybody in a bad situation. Yeah, that's really interesting, because the, the thing I'm seeing is not much is actually changing. People are getting measured on a different metric now pipeline, mm -hmm. but then you're going into the year, and this is every company I talk to is, cool, here's your Q1 pipeline number. It's like, well, that's already done. Like, what do you think? But then it's a whole marketing team's like, well, we have a pipeline number this quarter. What can we do right now? And then you're back to what I call like tactic focused marketing. You're back to yep. doing the short term. It's not leads, but it's still the same mindset, which is we're going to try to do everything we can right now. And that's actually what's happening. What I'm trying to like one help people understand and figure mm -hmm. out, which is aligning to revenue is great. So like you said, once you have like a scalable growth lever, but that's not what's happening. Most companies are coming to great. We're going to measure your own pipeline. Here's your goal this quarter. Good luck. Right, and everybody's scrambling for people who are already in market and to try and shove them into their pipeline. And you know, there's only so many people who are ready to have that sales conversation. Yep. And um, I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be a while before people kind of are able to get out of this and realize that, like, you know, some of the some of the brand things that our B two C brothers that I admire are doing are like actually quite good yeah and it's like well why what is it what are they doing that's working and um you know we've gone so far in the other direction as a b2b community yeah so i want to ask you about that actually because yeah. that's where i think most are going wrong under the ideas they're kind of figuring out oh there's all much so much supply for in-market buyers right. like you said so they're like cool we need to create demand and i think i always say like i don't want to say i felt victim to it, that's not the right word. I think I do what most marketers do is they're reading this stuff on like LinkedIn, they're getting it mm -hmm. from others and they're like, cool, yeah, I'm reading this like create demand thing. And we go just ungate our content and then we create awareness in the feed and like we do all these things and like these inbounds are gonna come in and um, like that's not really what happens. And I know you're like, you're a big believer like like we talk about like the narrative and things mm -hmm. like that, but that's, that's my biggest fear now is people are like, okay, cool, we're gonna do this long game, but they're really not playing the long game. Well, they're playing the long game with their short game tactics. Yes. They're taking they're taking that stupid ebook that you still can't send to people and yep. get leads from, and they're ungating it and putting it in the LinkedIn feed yep. instead of rethinking what that what their message should be. Yes. And like, what is somebody actually, you know, cause I always think about, you know, the defining the Delta. What is what are what is my ideal customer thinking now, and what do I need them to think to buy my product? And what are the ten things that they need to know to get there? Yes. And there, there's your content strategy. 
But that's where most go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I know we both uh, like agree with that. Um, and we like we've we've worked on a narrative before. We mm -hmm. went to go to market with that when we did that. I know we saw. I mean, we saw like two, three x increase in inbound volume. We saw huge in logos ICP coming inbound in. Inbound volume. Yes. Yeah. That was the other thing we saw. Like like the right fit job titles coming mm -hmm. in from enterprise buyers, and the big shift we made was like we quit running. Well, two things happen is is people are reading into creating demand as building a brand. Right. And I realized that's like a huge miss, which is people still don't want to learn about your company. They don't care about no. your pain points or any of that stuff. They don't want to learn that stuff. The only thing that you can teach them, or not teach them, but show them is what you said, which is like, ah, your buyer has this like story right now. Yep. And you should go to market with, hey, you have this story because that's going to resonate with their current mind state mm -hmm. and then show them um that that's not a winnable game anymore, essentially. Right. Well, I think I think a lot of brands lack have a point of view on their on their category and on the market mm. and on kind of where how how the how the buyer can change in a better way. Um, and if you don't have a lens in a, that's a compelling a compelling lens to to retell all of your content in, yeah. you're just saying the same thing as everybody else, and you get lost in a sea of bet, uh, you know the better trap yep. of you know this you know I'm the first or the best or whatever, and it's like nobody cares about those things. Yeah, that's the narr So it's funny because like, we talk about the narrative, and, and we've worked on it a lot and gone through that motion, and most get it wrong because they focus on. I, I've actually realized something working on a narrative with every customer. So, you know, like mm -hmm. that is, well, I think one of the biggest reasons we work together is like, oh, the narrative is the key to yep. making this whole thing come together. And what I learned is it exposes almost every company that they don't know their buyers like they think they do. Mm -hmm. Like it actually, like to me, it exposes when I work with customers and they're working on it. They're like, cool, here's our narrative. And I'm like, well, this is really all about your product and your buyer's pains, right? When the job of the narrative is to be like, hey, 2% of your market's in buy mode, great, go capture them. That's where everybody spends their budget right now. And then mm -hmm. they go, okay, cool, we'll do pain point stuff for our awareness strategy or just brand, or like, I see a lot of people getting like the entertainment thing and like, oh, that's just kind of overdone to myself or just overdone too, but it's, well, 90% of your buyers actually don't recognize pain, don't care about pain, or don't care enough about to solve it. Mm -hmm. So what can you really build awareness on? That's where most make the mistake, which is, what we've worked on is you need to go and understand your buyer's current state of mind, what yep. they believe about winning. Um, and that's what we did um, when we were working together, your first role, we, we worked with, yep. we built a start here page, we built a brand narrative around that. We actually positioned it, I don't think we did a category, I think we talked about a movement, right? Like mm -hmm. let's build a movement around this idea of, of how your world is changing and what you need to do and that's where we saw those mm -hmm. increased gains. Right, and that, yeah, that's what I meant by a, kind of a point of view. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's casting this, this, all of the conversations that are going around within your space in, mm -hmm. in a really ownable way. I think it's interesting you said point of view because what I always see happening is people take point of view as being like contrarian almost. Like most of the time mm. they try to get like a, oh, so I have to tell my buyers they're wrong or I have to, that's kind of what I think like I see a lot of people doing actually. Like it's almost like they're just being contrarian. That's a good point. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think you have to be disagreeing with people to have a point of view. Yeah, it's almost- It just so needs to be unique. <laughs> unique in the sense of, here's how I've always thought about it. I'm, if someone's reading your narrative it shouldn't be contrarian or anything. It, like a lot of people think like, oh, I have to convince my buyer like he's wrong and doing things wrong. It's almost reads like, like, oh, I've had this gut feeling about what I'm reading and mm -hmm. this is confirming it yep. for me. And that's what is missing for a lot of people. That's what I mean, like the, the level at which you need to understand your buyer now right. is greater. What I think it also comes down to like how is the sales team setting up their conversation? Because, you know, if they're setting up a FUD sale, like that's a that that sets up a different like expectation. And What's like, a FUD sale? Oh, I'm sorry, like I don't fear, know what a FUD certainty and doubt. Oh, okay, so now I should have known if that. If they're leaning into like this kind of contrarian viewpoint, yes, I actually think it's really important that that thread is pulled through the entire buying journey. Um, and I think a lot of teams don't get aligned with their sales yep. team on how they're telling the story. So I think sometimes it's appropriate to have 
a contrarian view if that's you know truly what it takes to to make a sale and you know and is kind of why people are buying from you in the first place yeah. I can see that. I can see people have talked to me and they go, oh, you mean like the Challenger sale? Is that what you're doing? Which is kind it of... Works really, narrative works really well with Challenger. We did that at my last company. We okay. had, we, we had um, the sales team was trained on Challenger and we rolled out a narrative at the same time. Yep. And that's um, actually might be like some great uh, information because that's something even we're struggling now with mm -hmm. customers is we get this great narrative, right? And then we're going down the funnel and sales is still pitching on pain points. Right. Like, how did you actually go through that? Or how did you help get sales aligned on the narrative to actually, because even now, like we're experiencing that across all of our accounts, mm -hmm. which is like, oh great, inbound's going up. And then like, it's just falling off a cliff because the story isn't mm -hmm. followed all the way through. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, straight out of Andy Raskin's playbook, but it all starts with the sales deck. Because, I mean, I didn't, I didn't write the narrative first. I wrote, we, I worked on the sales deck. That is true. That is right. You did when uh -huh. we worked on the, yeah, you did have the sales deck first. That is okay. what I started with. And, you know, that, that getting buy-in across all of sales and, you know, working really closely with the sales engineering team yeah. on like, how is that delivered? How are we making our team demo ready? How are we, you know, getting the field yeah. up and running and bought into this was like step one. Mm. And, 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 you know, and, and I think, you know, ideally that, you know, as because we were kind of testing that market on LinkedIn yeah. and we were using kind of some proof of validation and things like that while I was getting all of the sales team trained on it. And so those things kind of like worked together. I, yeah. I think you, you kind of have to think about this as a really holistic company strategy because this is this is business strategy. It's not just yeah. marketing. That's something maybe even, you know, as it outsider it's difficult for me mm -hmm. to always do that but even i have customers now where i'm actually building relationships with like the ceo and that's like what we're talking about i'm like yep like i the other thing i've run into a lot too is like they're telling the story of their company and like why it was built and things like that like that's actually what i ran into is like we have this great narrative and it's working it's working within the marketing and then we're like it's falling off in sales and i'm like are you guys like telling the story and like oh yeah we're telling the story and then i went through the deck and it was like no you're telling your story yeah you're not telling the buyer story yep. and that's your huge miss with this well all, i mean founders love telling their story yes that's but, true but i mean it's <laughs> yes um no that's interesting because the way we've always approached it right uh like the start here mm -hmm. page we say build a start here page start your narrative we will gain momentum and it's almost like our job is almost i don't want to say this in a bad way it's like we'll start putting pressure on sales to adjust because all these inbounds are gonna come in. Mm -hmm. People are gonna notice it. And part of maybe our job and how we think about it is, we want people to realize the power of building a narrative and what that'll do for yep. you. So we say, well, just start with the start here page. You will start gaining momentum when you have the right narrative. And then we, we validate, commit and scale it as we get learnings back. Uh, like you said, the like growth experiments and stuff like that. But that's the approach that we've taken I guess I haven't taken or thought about it from starting with sales. I mean, it's it's probably, you know, something just to think about with clients because, yeah. you know, they're, they're the ones sitting in the chair of, you know, being accountable to, you know, essentially yeah. the, the the revenue outcomes of the program. And so, you know, you can't you can't change a company strategy in a vacuum. How are you going about narrative now? You st you have a new role, so now it's mm -hmm. like you get to work on a second one. Yes. How do you how do you start coming in and like because like you're a big believer now, like you're like we want to start with narrative. We are going to figure this out right yeah. away. Like how do you come in and say like this is our mission to figure that out? I mean, it's an interesting thing because you know I'm I am starting with the basics though, not not starting with narrative, but I'm starting with what's our go-to-market? Like, how do we view the market today? How are we segmenting our buyers? Um, you know, what, where, what is their headspace? What do they care? And what are the different, like, basically market signals that they might be thinking more yep. like we think? 
Um, and so, so it's kind of, you know, that's, that's like step one. And then it's like also thinking, okay, so what does our product deliver today? What are the key features and functionalities? What's the unique buying proposition that's fueling kind of the, the current customers? And what's our unfair competitive advantage there? So, you know, what is our secret sauce? And then those things kind of come in and that, that's starting to, to, to gel for me together mm -hmm. to form the basis of the narrative. Um, I mean, and you know, I'm, I, you know, selectively picked a company where I thought there was a natural narrative yep. um, that's kind of in a, a new emerging, almost nascent market where, you know, we have an opportunity to kind of lead yep. that and really frame the problem and own the solution. Um, so like some of these things were already percolating like well before accepting the role. <laughs> that's, um, you, well, you described something and I know you don't, I don't think you even intended to, or you, you uh, like you described how we said like, there's four sources of growth, right? Mm -hmm. And you're actually trying to figure out how they work together. Cause you said like market, right? And to us that's category. And I, I think we probably see it through the same lens. Like a lot of people think market and they think some of more what you said, like target ACP personas and that stuff matters. But when I think about category and market, I think about it to help establish the narrative, which is where can we gain an unfair competitive advantage or see the market differently or see an unseen problem mm -hmm. to almost shape your own category or market. And then it's figuring out where you went back and said like, well, how can the product play within this, right? And then you said, we're gonna figure out the story after that, which is really how we view it too. Like through the, those are all sources that you can drive growth if you can see the market differently, mm -hmm. if you can build your product to support the market and the narrative. And then your last piece is just, we have to figure out the acquisition channels to right. go, where does where can we take this category? Where will our product fit well? And where can we take our message exactly. with these four sources? And that's where, where you said we kind of do the basics. I'm like, yeah, we do the basics too, but most never graduate out of it. They kind of like, they create all those in silos, I call it, right? Like, here's our product, here's our market, here's our story, here's some channels, and we go do a bunch of tactics around that stuff mm -hmm. where I say like, the big thing is figuring out how those all play together to make up your go-to-market strategy. And that's what a lot of people don't do. They get market and product and that kind of works together. And they're like, okay, cool. we're going to do some like other narrative message stuff and some product stuff instead of aligning all of those sources. Right. Well, and I think, I think a lot of times people get stuck in, you know, what what is the current thinking about the market um and mm. in the you know we're like okay here's who we think the buyer is and they're like let's go and you fail to like say like well why are not these groups and then and then also zooming back out and saying okay what are the adjacent categories in the market why are they there why would people choose that over this um i think there's just a lot of um more macro um like intelligence that needs to go into understanding the market than yeah. zooming straight into, you know, what are the firmographic characteristics of my accounts? What's up most people, maybe I'm wrong. Like I've never, I can't do the politics inside being internal companies, but I've learned <laughs> like, at least maybe how it felt more is like internal contributor moving up, you know, like director and stuff. And mm -hmm. I did some direct reports for a while, but I realized like, sitting in that kind of mid-level role, which I think a lot of people sit in, you feel like this whole kind of go-to-market thing is created in a vacuum in a boardroom. Like, okay, well, we're going to get together. Here's our revenue goals. We have product features. Then it's like marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay, just go execute your... Yeah, turn on marketing. Yes, like turn on marketing <laughs> instead of, right? Like people are not, and I actually like really mean this, they're not figuring out how those things work together mm -hmm. to make their go-to-market. Well, I think what happens is people people just decide what they'd ideally like it to be. And then they set their goals and targets around that and not based on reality. Because you're like, yeah, yes. wouldn't it be great if only enterprise buyers wanted our product? Yes. That would, yes, that would be fantastic. Or that's the other thing that happens, right? They build the product and then it's saying, oh, here's the opportunity. It's like, well, too bad marketing. You, you gotta make this work, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is what we're selling into because yep. the board decided this is what we're gonna sell into. And it's like, well, guys, the opportunity isn't like this product it's over doesn't here. fit in this market. It's, yes, it fits this other one over here. I know it's not what you want to hear. <laughs> yes, I love it. That's great. <laughs>